Well, it's the beginning of a new week. Hello, good evening to you. Welcome. This is Ghana Tonight. We are live from on news about Tadesawe Kanda, also live on TV3 Ghana on Facebook, the SV channel 279, all across the world on 3news.com. I am out for the concert. Tonight, 12 convicted and sentenced to life imprisonment and two acquitted and discharged in the murder trial of Major Maxwell Adam Mahama, who was slain seven years ago at Dentrobwasi. We have the details, including an interview with the father of the fallen soldier. We are also in the Yendi constituency in the northern region, where the new Patriotic Party parliamentary primaries in the area ended in chaos, rendering the whole exercise fruitless without an official winner. We delve into the issues and more, including an injunction on the Waliwale -Wale constituency outcome of the primaries that is just coming through right now also the three west african states have pulled out of the economic community of west african states ECOWAS. what does that mean for the strikes towards west african unity and what are the security implications for us here in ghana kennel festo sabwaje retired is our guest here on ghana tonight as always your thoughts and views, comments and opinions are welcome. You are an integral part of the conversation. Let's hear from you. The hashtag we're using is Ghana Tonight on Facebook and X. Let's get talking. I am out for the country. Let's settle for the top stories summarized on Ghana Breeze. Late emotions, shouts of joy from the corner of the courtroom where family of the slain soldier Major Maxwell Mahama were seated and echoes of regret, pain and despair by the convicts after the jury delivered its verdict after the seven-year murder trial. Twelve convicts were sentenced to life imprisonment and two others freed. There is no point at all engaging in mob justice. But clearly, there was a situation where a person who was innocent, I mean, was gruesomely murdered under such circumstances. And I believe that the whole nation learned from it and need to put an end to mob justice in Ghana. Um, I was quite appalled to see the videos of Major Mahama on social media. And at least we have seen that mob justice does not pay. Ultimately, the views of justice will catch up with you. And if you think that you can resort to and justice by yourself, you yourself will be dealt with in accordance with law. The two major political parties, the NPP and NDC, differ in opinion over the Electoral Commission's proposal to change the date of general elections from December 7 to November. The proposal was the major issue for discussion by participants at Monday's Inter-Party Advisory Committee meeting. While the NDC wants the proposal implemented in the 2028 general elections, the NPP wants the EC to be allowed to do what is best for the country. My, the NDC position, which I think was largely the position of many other political parties, was that the time to have it done will be post-2024 in order to allow the whole of the country, the Electoral Commission, Parliament, everybody to prepare properly. Now leave everything the care of the EC to come out with their program liner for the year and we'll see how it goes. I'm saying strangely the NDC uh, are saying no because they had in 2016 proposed the November 7 idea. The Asantiman Traditional Council has advised chiefs in the region to avoid partisan politics. The issue of chiefs indulging in partisan politics came up strongly when the Asantiman Council sat on the alleged Buntumi derogatory comment at the Menshia Palace. <laughs> My constituency chairman even tried to calm wound to me, but he wouldn't listen. The first thing that came from his mouth was, look, nobody can gag me. Even if Otunfo says something which I disagree, I will challenge him. I have my own kingdom. Flag bearer of the National Democratic Congress, John Mahama, has urged local businesses to embrace the 24-hour economy game changer as the party prepares to regain power. 
The former president has been addressing members of the Council of Indigenous Businesses in Accra as part of efforts by the NDC to craft the People's Manifesto. From 2019, we could tell that this government was overborrowing, and not only overborrowing, but using most of the borrowing for consumption rather than for infrastructure and production. And so we kept raising the red flag. And um, unfortunately, we have ended where we have ended. Just a few days ago, the IMF said that despite the debt restructuring, Ghana's debt is still unsustainable. The Senior Staff Association of Universities of Ghana says it will not call off a strike despite government and the university management assurances to get the second-tier pension arrears and overtime allowance paid. The association is requesting a government roadmap outlining the payment schedule before calling off a strike. One, then it has to do with the, our vis-a-vis -vis condition of service. Fortunately, those things have been resolved and then National Labor Commission also um, uh, added their voice to it that that document should be redrawn. So it is, that one is served. With, it's left with the pension issues that we are talking about. The interest that is supposed to be paid on the pension fund. The penalties that the government is supposed to pay on the uh, uh, pension fund. Well, there's more news on 3news.com. Make some time and visit 3news.com. This is Ghana Tonight. Coming up next, 12 convicted and sentenced to life imprisonment and two others acquitted and discharged in the murder trial of Major Maxwell Adam Mahama, who was slain seven years ago at Dentro Bossi. Uh, we have the details, including an interview with the father of the fallen soldier here on Ghana tonight. And this brings back very, very sad memories for those who are even close and far from uh, the late Major Maxwell Mahama. Split emotions indeed, uh, shouts of joy from the various aspects of the courtroom where the family of the slain soldier, Major Maxwell Mahama, uh, the late, uh, were seated and echoes of regret, pain, uh, and despair by the convicts after the jury delivered its verdict after the seven-year murder trial. It's been going on for the past seven years. Talking about 12 convicts who were sentenced to life imprisonment and two others who were freed. Now, for many, this is a testament of the proverbial saying that the wheels of justice really do grind slowly, but will get to its, its destination. But first, let's look at how this case developed over the period, over the seven years we're talking about. And we'll take you into the courtroom and, and what happened and, and the wailing uh, mother of Major Mahama shortly here on Ghana tonight. But take a look at this. And as we chronicle the events over the period, he was an army captain. At the time, he was killed by a mob at Denchirabwase in the central region on the 29th of May, 2017. That's when this dastardly act occurred. Then... 14 persons, including the assemblyman of the area, William Barr, were arrested. These are the, the picture you see there are the 14 who were arrested uh, when this incident happened in 2017. Now take a look at this. The charges that were leveled against them, abetment of murder, conspiracy to commit murder, and murder. Then, eventually, the Supreme Court Judge Mariama Usu uh, was handling the case as an additional high court judge together with a seven-member jury have been sitting on this case over the period and now we've seen this judgment that has been delivered but the mother of the slain major mahama who had earlier broken down in court spoke to the media after the judgment was delivered earlier today take a look my son has been determined and i am thankful to god for the strength to endure over six years of agonizing pain. The twists and turns of events as, as an associated heartache is unspeakable. God knows my plight as a mother whose loving son was snatched away from her in such 
Corey, Mama, Gerf. Family and friends, I can't even see. Really, really sad situation there, and then the emotions were telling, and, and this is what got a number of people talking seven years ago. The, the, the activities, the incident that led to his murder is another conversation, but Captain Dennis Adam Mahama, retired, is the father of the late Major Maxwell Adam Mahama. Captain Dennis Adam Mahama, thank you so much for joining us here on Ghana tonight. Uh, just connecting with us on the telephone. Appreciate your time. Now, uh, how did the family uh, receive this judgment that was delivered today? Uh, these 12 persons who have been slapped with uh, life sentence as we speak. My brother, almost seven years. After uh, I now, the Ghana uh, judgment has come. We'll take it like that. Indeed, but th does this meet the family's expectations? I mean, over the seven years you've been going to court and, and then also bearing this agony, does this life imprisonment sentence slapped on these 12 meet the expectations of the family? At all. You know very well that there are three videos, three separate video versions, the recordings of how the uh, there is a bunch of people uh, took on this uh, innocent person. And so with the three sessions, you can see that there are over a hundred people, those who were clubbing, those who were preventing him from dying, encouraging others to do what they did. But we see all of them as accomplices. Those who did the act and then those who were accomplices. So if uh, we got only 14 and 12 have been uh, found guilty, well, that is the law, so we'll take it like that. I'll take it like that. But you, you've indicated quite clearly that this 12 years, that the, tw the 12 persons slapped with life imprisonment does not meet the expectations of the family. The three videos that you talk about, that you just made reference to, was it adduced as evidence at any point during the trial? They were all accepted in evidence. They were accepted in court as evidence. The CID produced all of them for a prosecution and they presented them in court. They were all accepted in evidence. I see. And, and so uh, what, what was the court's pronouncement or position on the three videos that you say contains more evidence of a number of people who were engaged in the lynching of Major Mahama? Yeah, what I know is that the CID has not closed the case. What they are saying is that there are more people in the video that uh, are accomplices and uh, they think that they will have to fix them up. So it's ongoing, we'll see. So you see, the CID says there are, there are more people in the video that you refer to, and so they haven't closed the case? Is, is, that, is that the position of the CID? Let me get the understanding. I mean, the, the CID have not finished arresting all the culprits. I see. Those that they have arrested are those that have been tried today. But according to them, there are more on the run, which they are yet to pick out. And when they get them, they will also put them before court like they done to this group of people. I see. So it means that for these 12 who have been convicted today, that's the end of their case. But for the CID, they're going to continue the investigations to find or, as it were, identify the other persons who were captured in this video that you have? Case, there are 14 people who are arrested. That's the end of it. Okay. But the 
the, 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 the crime of murder committed by people. There are some on this uh, gentleman, there are more people on the run. With the CID is saying that they are yet to close in on them. That's not the end of uh, uh, the, 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 the criminals. Yes, and, and, and this is a, a very important detail you've given to us there, uh, that as we do know now that the CID uh, would continue also investigating, at least based on the videos you have and the number of people who have been captured in there. But how has the family been living with, with this pain over the last seven years? Um, if you could share with us, Captain Mama, please. Oh, quite well. My only worry is the mother. The mother is the one suffering. The mother is the one suffering. She's, she's been crying and crying and crying. The slightest uh, memory of this boy is right, and she has to be hospitalized and all that. That is what has been happening for the past six years. That's the only problem. Other than that, I'm okay, even though I'm also uh, in grievance. But I'm okay. The wife and children, they are okay. Well, indeed, and uh, we, we, we're thankful that you're okay and also taking the time to, to join us. I, I'm going to have just thank you so much. Thank you for joining us. Um, just Captain Dennis Adam Mahama, uh, retired, is the father of the late Major Maxwell Mahama uh, talking to us here on Ghana Tonight. We do appreciate the time that you took to talk to us in the midst of everything that's happening right now. Thank you so much for joining us here on Ghana tonight. And this is an issue that also we'll, we'll keep an eye on, especially with the revelation tonight that indeed, even though these 12 have been slapped with the life imprisonment, the CID will continue investigating uh, this case because there are others who are on the run. And there are others who have been captured on three videos that the CID has in their custody that they are going to be looking into to possibly arrest more persons who are involved in the lynching of Major Maxwell Mahama the late. Now, uh, coming up next here on Ghana Tonight, we're, we're going to Yendi uh, constituency and now in the northern region where the new Petrotti party, its parliamentary primaries in the area ended in chaos, rendering the whole exercise fruitless without an official winner. We're gonna delve into the issue and more, including an injunction on the Wale Wale constituency outcome, which came through not too long ago. So the Electoral Commission is the latest to come public on this uh, Yendi situation. They have said that as far as it is concerned, that's the EC, there was no winner in the Yendi parliamentary primaries of the MPP. And thus they've distanced themselves from the supposed results declared in this said election. You recall that the, the executives in that area, the MPP, declared uh, the incumbent member of parliament, the winner of this primary, says no, it, it didn't happen. There was violence that disrupted the entire exercise. The incumbent Yendi MP Farouk Aliou Mahama and the chief executive officer of the microfinance and small loan center, Maslok Hajia Abiba, Shani Mahama, Zakaria, all claimed that they have won the election, the two of them. So here's a statement from the electoral commission. I'm going to put that on the screen right now. The EC has been very clear on their position on this matter, that nobody was declared officially. The AC says the attention of the Electoral Commission has been drawn to a video circulating on social media depicting a gentleman declaring results of the just ended New Petrotti Party parliamentary primaries in the Yendi constituency in favor of the incumbent. The Electoral Commission wishes to inform the general public that it has not declared results from the Yendi constituency in the just ended MPP parliamentary elections. 785 voters voted out of 794 registered voters. The counting of ballots for the incumbent, Farouk Aliou Mahama, was disrupted when the presiding officer had counted 296 votes in his favor. Unfortunately, the destruction of the 489 ballots, which remained to be counted, made it impossible for the presiding officer to complete the coalition and declare the results. The commission therefore disassociates itself from the declaration of Farouk Mahama as the winner of this MPP parliamentary primaries 
in the Yendi constituency. So the Election Commission is clear on this matter. They haven't declared anybody as a winner. But there was a statement earlier from Hajia Abiba. Uh, she recounts what is, she says are the events of the day. The Electoral Commission has just indicated what happened, the disruption of the counting process. According to one of the aspirants, her attention has been drawn to this video, and we'll put that, that part of, portions of that statement she issued earlier on the screen shortly. Um, says the National Vice Chair of the MPP in, in that area declaring Farouk Aliu Mahama as the parliamentary candidate-elect for the Yendi constituency after the Saturday 27 January 2024 parliamentary primaries were disrupted. They want to state the facts, and that's what you see there. According to her, counting of ballot papers in the 2024 Yendi parliamentary election was profoundly and fiercely interrupted and halted due to a deliberate attempt by some electoral commission officials to manipulate the figures and overturn the verdict in favor of the incumbent MP Farouk Alumama. The electoral commission did not state this. They said the officials were counting, the thing was disrupted. Now, this is an allegation that one of the aspirants is making directly against the Electoral Commission. She continues that the Electoral Commission officials, whether by miscalculation or by design, during the counting of the ballot papers in the full glare of party supporters, jumped the count from 69 straight to 80, which was his first attempt to increase the votes of my opponent by 10 more. Says as if it, 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 that was not enough, they were also caught by vigilant agents of mine and other observers for fraudulently destroying and even concealing some of the ballot papers belonging to Hajia Abibata in his jacket. Now, the, the malevolent actions of the EC officials quickly provoked violent attacks from some party supporters who ended up destroying the ballot papers. So, that um, says it took the swift intervention of the police present to protect the, the officials um, over there. So that's uh, Hajia Abibate's account of what happened, as against what the Electoral Commission has said. Evans Nemakos, the Director of Research and Elections of the New Patriotic Party, he's been speaking on this issue and what the party intends to do going forward. Take a look. Uh, the party found out regional officers and national officers to ensure that the guidelines, the protocols issued by the general secretary are all complied. Our at this point uh, request of you that we exercise a bit of uh, constraint and receive from our regional and national uh, monitors who are assigned to the Yendi constituency as well as report from the Ghana Police Service and the Electoral Commission. That in the case of Yendi constituency, uh, we exercise a bit of uh, restraint and, and, and calm down whatever tension there is and appeal to party members in the constituency that they respect the guidelines that were given. Uh, the party is awaiting a report from the regional and national representatives who were assigned to the constituency, as well as collaborating it with the report from the Electoral Commission and the Ghana Police Service. Well, so that's Ivan Sinemako there, and uh, th that's the position they have also stated. And you have indicated, as, as well, we've indicated what the Electoral Commission has said, that there is no declared winner for the END primaries. Well, we are just receiving another statement this time an injunction guess what the incumbent member of parliament for the waliwali constituency in the northeast region hajiala riba zuera abudu this is the minister for gender children and social protection she has secured an injunction restraining the parliamentary candidate elect for the waliwali constituency dr kabiru tia mahama who is the vice president dr mahmoud Bar flagbar of the mpp's um, special assistant from holding himself as, out as such. Now, the gender minister is contesting the outcome of the election on Saturday. Now, here's a copy of the injunction that we have secured here on, on Ghana Tonight. So, that's what's happening right now, that this is it. 
she's gone to the high court in Tamale, and you see there, Lariba Zura Abudu versus Dr. Kabiru Tiamahama and two others. Order of interim injunction. Upon reading the affidavit of Lariba Zura Abudu, of gives details of her house number, Walla Walla in the Northeast region, filed on the 29th day of January. That's today in support of motion ex parte for an order for an interim injunction. And upon hearing Sylvester Isan Esquire, counsel for and on behalf of plaintiff applicant hearing, it is hereby ordered that the defendants are restrained hearing, whether by themselves, their agents, assigns, workmen, and all persons from holding out the first defendant, that is Dr. Kabiru Mahama, as the MPP parliamentary candidate elect for the Wale Wale constituency. That's the constituency of the, of the flag bearer of the MPP, the vice president for the 2024 parliamentary elections and or from submitting the name of the first defendant to the new Petote Party national office as a candidate elect during that primaries. It is further ordered that this order shall hold for 10 days where af after the plaintiff applicant may come on notice to the defendants giving under the hand and seal of the High Court of Tamale today the 29th day of January. So this is an interim injunction that has just come through. And uh, we've just secured a copy here on Ghana tonight on your election command center. We've been working on the phones uh, to get through to the party uh, officials to speak to this latest one from Wale Wale. But now we, we, we've yet to, to make any breakthrough. But coming up next, there's an issue that's also very prevalent in this just in the primaries of the MPP, the conversation of vote buying and voter inducement increasingly becoming a major component of public elections in Ghana, though the law frowns on it. But how do we deal with it? Now, that's the concern that many have been also expressing, especially because if this continues, it has its own security implications and even some less qualified persons getting into parliament to make laws for you and I. Think about it. Member of parliament for the Asanchiachim North Constituency, uh, and the appear could be who won his primaries, by the way, is worried about the growing monetization of the politics in the country. Take a look. The monetization that is coming into politics is making politics unattractive. And I tell you, and I sound this warning, if this is the way we are going to go all out, next time I will not be competing because it's not worth spending all this kind of money and not getting anything back. Unfortunately, people think that when you go to parliament, you make money. The, uh, the converse is the, is the truth. It is an exact opposite. People who come to parliament, if you don't have any profession, you will not be able to succeed in parliament. And most of our people are losing because they didn't have the capacity, the financial resources to contest. Some of us have come through because of our professional earnings. We can continue to earn the money in our professions and come and dump them in politics and even attract the insults and the undermining and the name calling. So politics is becoming unattractive. And I'm serving this note that if we don't change our ways of selection, I will not be a candidate next time. We need to select people who have the capacity and the competence and the interest and the energy to go into parliament. We don't have to pick anybody to go into parliament. I cannot be a, a mason. I cannot be a carpenter, but I can be a lawyer. So if you look at my competencies, place me where I belong. Don't allow it to be an open enterprise that anybody without any preparation at all will come in and because he has blood money, he will throw the money about and become a member of parliament. He comes to parliament and he cannot perform. And I'm saying this, I'm very serious about it. Not many people will tell you what we are going through, but I'm saying it. And I think that people will take me serious. I know that the monetization will bring wrong candidates. That's um, the appear could be there. He's a private legal practitioner, he's a member of parliament. Now, says the monetization is going to bring wrong candidates to parliament to make laws for you and I. He speaks very passionately about this. In fact, he was one of a few persons whose constituency was a place to watch. He, together with the likes of Eugene H., who, who lost the Subin constituency primaries, were the persons who led the 98 MPP MPs who were famously styled or referred to as, as the rebel leaders to impress on the president to sack Ken Ofriata as finance minister. So Eugene Inchi lost, but 
and he appeared to be won this primaries. And you can tell from what we just played, he had to really work hard, and it's quite telling. Dr. Rashid Draman is the Executive Director of the Africa Center for Parliamentary Affairs. He's joining us on Zoom. Rashid Draman, thank you. Thank you so much for joining us here on Ghana tonight. Now, whenever this conversation about the attrition rate, that's the experienced MPs leaving uh, Parliament, there's always that counter-argument that the new ones will learn over time. Is it that straightforward? It is not, especially today, if you look at the situation where most uh, new MPs, when they come into the House, we have a lot of struggle sometimes for the Speaker to get a quorum. Uh, people come in there, they get very busy with other business, uh, except the business of the House. You add that to a situation where, you know, we don't have a kind of regular uh, uh, induction. Uh, and regular preparation uh, for new entrance into parliament. It becomes very complicated. It's not a straightforward issue. Uh, in, indeed. But uh, you, you've, I'm sure you've been listening to uh, Andy Apia Kobe, who makes the point that, yes, even if, they, if this continues, he's not going to contest the next election because he doesn't have money. And, and he's had to spend so much money to win this primaries of the MPP that ended over the weekend. As well, this this the push factor of monetization of our politics that he makes reference to. Does it concern you as well? I mean, Alfred, that's uh, if nothing is done. I think in the next few cycles of our election, we are going to have a big crisis on our hands uh, because um, those who have money are going to line up. Uh, to go into parliament is going to be like a buffet. If I can, I mean, maybe we use a, a jargon, and experienced MPs who don't have fat wallets are going to continue to get pushed out. Um, that is not going to be good for our, our democracy, and uh, you know, even the national security implication of that. Um, all these people who have money and they are pushing experienced MPs out. Where are they getting the monies from? Who is funding them? You know, what is the interest of all these people who are providing them with funding? We need to interrogate all these and the implications of of that on, uh, on the quality of our democracy. And I talk about quality. Will, will this monetization of this process, of even the primaries, as Andy Apia could be a said, he had to spend so much money, and that can be the same chorus that many others would sing if we should put the microphone to them. W w would it get to the point where we would not have the quality of representation that we need in Parliament because it's all about the money? If you can spend that much, give that much, you would be guaranteed of winning an election. Of course, uh, Alfred, without a doubt, you know, I can tell you on authority that some of the people who have decided not to contest, some of them lament that those who have come with big monies to replace them uh, are people who uh, perhaps are ill-prepared uh, with very little or no education, you know, to go into parliament. Uh, you get them in there, um, certainly quality is going to be affected. Yeah, indeed. Uh, Dr. Ajit Raman, I appreciate your time. I know you're on the move. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much for joining us here on Ghana Tonight. He's the director of the Africa Center for Parliamentary Affairs. Dr. Rashid Raman, thank you for joining us. And a bit on this, my colleague, Betu Sedu, also sat with Dr. Kojopo Bunia Asante, He's the director of programs and policy engagement at the Center for Democratic Development, CDD, on this same issue of vote buying. Take a look come up in recent times is vote buying. Yes. For you at CDD, how do you think we can nip this in the bud? Well, I think for me, I like the intervention of the, the special prosecutor because see, for a long time, it's almost like everybody talks about it, but we are all participants in it, whether it's delegates or voters, you know, so the, the, the parties say, oh, this is what the people are demanding. If we don't pay them money, they won't vote for us. And then the people say, oh, they are stealing our money, you know, to influence our votes. Some, something, somebody has to be held accountable. And I think both the person who is receiving and the person who is giving have to be held accountable. So I'm glad that there is some punitive threat 
to the individuals who are going there, either soliciting or receiving that money, and the people who are also giving it. And if we don't see action, some sort of a deterrent, then we are really going to undermine our democracy. Once you make the democracy about money, then you can just imagine all sorts of things. We are here talking about Galamse and all of those things. All that money will run back into elections. So you're going to elect people who are there, they've paid their way, they're going to go into government looking for opportunities to recoup their investment. They're not going to be doing any policy. They're not going to solve any problem for the citizen. And that would weaken any democracy that we have. And our democracy is already suffering. You think that punitive threats at this stage is what would nip the problem in the bud? I think you need that immediately because the kind of rampant nature and impunity with which people are doing it. But overall, of course, you need very clear legislation to deal with it. And also we have to address the issue of campaign and political financing of parties. You know, the, the, how pe where people get their money, the fact that people don't disclose where the money's come from, it's all part of it. It's all part of the monetization of, of, of our elections. But, Doc, it's obvious that there have been a lot of threats over the period. Uh, we've also had some sort of leg legislation, as it were, because at least you have the OSP, you have some other institutions that are supposed to be helping, preventing and the, exposing these things. But we are still seeing it. I don't think we've had... The, the, the level of uh, attention that vote buying has, has you know, kind of attracted it a lot, particularly because there are direct attempts to actually arrest people and investigate matters and so on. There are some cases actually in court. And if those cases, you know, the person is, is, is prosecuted and, and jailed or has a jail time, I think it will serve as a deterrent. So, even though it's a, be a long-standing issue for us, it's always be a long-standing issue. This is the first time I'm really seeing, even from the parties themselves, saying that the monetization is completely, you know, uh, destroying our parties. We don't know who we are electing into it. Everybody's bringing money from whatever. So there is some consensus that we have to do something about it. But as we wait for whether it is a legislation to deal substantively with it, Let's make sure that the impunity that is happening now, at least, it stops. So I'm glad that we are going to a period where, okay, the primaries are done. Now you are talking about public elections where if you are caught, you should be, you know, uh, prosecuted and jailed. The, the law is very clear. PNDC law 284 is very clear on this type of bribery. So I don't see any qualms. In and I think the OSP should be encouraged to set examples so that you know, we can nip this in, stuff in the bud. You know, if you look at the kinds of things people are doing, it's, it's completely, it's, it's crazy. Finally, from me, you mentioned a very important subject as well, which is something you've been uh, hammering over a period of time, political party yes, financing. Right, yeah. Where do we start this, pro what, where do we start from in terms of addressing this very challenge? We, we, we've been working on it for a long time. We had a stakeholder group that have developed a roadmap uh, looking at you know what we can do in the short term, in the long term, and so on. Eventually, we need a new legislation because we've looked at the current legislation, uh, Polka parties are, PNDC law, they are all kind of scattered all around. You need a comprehensive that will address the issue of expenditure caps and, and disclosures and so on. And then the question is really the enforcement. Should it be the Electoral Commission that is going to do that, or you need uh, a party financing you know, uh, institution to do that? But I think that even if uh, nothing gets done, at least if we can start working on the legislation, we'll make everything. One of the things we have to make sure is that the parties have to commit in this election to reforming party financing, not in sort of generic terms. It has to be very clear what they are going to do in the time frame for doing it. Very clear. That's Kojo Pumpuni Asante there. But you may recall the special prosecutor is already investigating some persons on this issue of vote buying um, in the, the NPP's presidential primaries and then also subsequent elections. Well, he's been speaking to a very brief one. My colleague, Peter uh, Sedu, caught up with Kisi Jabeng earlier today at this CDD event on the issue of vote buying, as far as his office has gone with respect to investigations into these allegations of vote buying. Take a look. 
Wait, I'm live on your thing. No, I'm actually recording you. So you haven't returned or you don't want to disclose? I, I didn't say that. I said okay. I wasn't going to disclose it to you. Okay, but okay. You also told us that you were investigating uh, vote by. Can you tell us uh, how far you pushed through that? Which specific? I mean, the presidential uh, primary, MPP's presidential primary. You have some you evidence. The uh, yes, and then even the parliamentary one. Are you able to tell us uh, how far you pushed that regard? We don't disclose where we've got into in the middle of investigations. I keep saying this. It's a policy and it's no good. You compromise investigations if you keep giving minute-by-minute minute account of what you are doing. You, you get me? And that is why we don't, we don't disclose. But at least, even the, right the time, first one, the 72 yeah, hours... At the right yeah. time, at the right time, when we are ready to come to the public, Okay, you being there. This is a special prosecutor. Uh, this is Ghana tonight. Remember, we're live on TVC Ghana on Facebook. Now we're going to go straight to issues of uh, sub-regional importance because uh, three West African states have pulled out of the economic community of West African states. ECOWAS. What does this mean, especially for us here as a country? You know, we import a number of uh, food items from Niger and Burkina Faso. Onion, for instance. And so with, with all of this, what does this mean? How does this impact on us as a country and also on issues of security and dealing with these insurgents? Stay with us. We'll be back shortly. Welcome back. This is Ghana Tonight. Now, Niger, Mali, and Burkina Faso have announced they are leaving the economic community of West African states, ECOWAS. Now, the junta-led countries had already been suspended from ECOWAS, which has been urging them to return to democratic rule. But the three governments said it was a sovereign decision to withdraw from ECOWAS. Now, ECOWAS says it is yet to receive any official communicate to that effect. Now, here's a release from the regional bloc. We're going to put it on the screen shortly. Um, uh, we received earlier today, uh, specifically indicating that their attention as an ECOWAS uh, has been drawn to a statement broadcast on national televisions of Mali and Niger announcing the decision of Burkina Faso, Mali and Niger to withdraw from ECOWAS. Now, the ECOWAS Commission says it is yet to receive any direct formal notification from the three member states about their intention to withdraw from the community. The ECOWAS Commission, as directed by the authority of heads of state and government, has been working assiduously with these countries for the restoration of constitutional order. Bear in mind that these three countries experience coups that led to the overthrow and uh, removal of the uh, their presidents and heads of states between last year and also 2022. So that is what is happening now. These are the three leaders of Burkina Faso, Niger, and also Mali, the three military leaders, three of them. Now, this has generated a lot of, of conversation as to beyond the regional bloc's implication, how this is also going to impact on us um, as, as a country sharing a border with Burkina Faso as well. Ken Ofeso Sabaji, uh, retired, is a security expert. Ken Ofeso Sabaji, thank you for joining us here on Ghana Tonight. This is a case that you've been monitoring quite closely um, right from 2022 to date. Would you say that this development or the decision by these three countries to withdraw from ECOWAS is a surprise based on the activities that built up to today? Once again, thanks for having me. I think if one one looks at the 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 timelines that brought us up to yesterday, um, back from about 2020, 2021, and critically last year, after the removal of uh, Mohammed Bazoum and the seba rattling on the part of the Kowaz in Nigeria to mobilize forces to restore constitutional order and so on and so forth, the imposition of the sanctions, you know, 
very discriminatory, I mean, very indiscriminate um, sanctions. And then coming back to last year, September, when the three countries that are now threatening to leave decided to establish their own separate defense mechanism that they call the Alliance of the Sahelian States or AES in French. Alliance des Etats Sahel. Mm. Seen that at some point in time, they were going to make a clean break uh, from ECOWAS. If ECOWAS on its part did not, you know, change its stance, this hostility and lack of respect, you know, for, for those countries. So in that context, I belong to the school of thought that this didn't come as a surprise. It was a matter of time that it was going to happen. Mm, and it uh, did happen yesterday. Indeed, it did. Uh, not a surprise if you look at the, the events preceding this announcement. But what are the implications, kind of a budget, um, if you talk about security or trade implications of this decision by these three countries on Ghana, for instance? The implications go beyond security. I think the conversation should start from the, 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 the mandate, the objective of ECOWAS as a body that seeks to establish, to integrate its members and economically enhance, you know, the development of those countries. Uh, deep in trade, for instance, um, deep in their political, diplomatic, and other engagements, you know. And then the dimension of security, especially the threat of terrorism uh, since about 2012, after the implosion of Libya in 2011. So in all of these dimensions, both sides, that is the AES, the Alliance and ECOWAS, stand to lose. People, goods and services now move freely uh, within the ECOWAS subregion. After one year, that will not be the reality. The reality will be that goods entering the ECOWAS um, you know, marketplace from these Sahelian countries will attract tariffs. So if you use Ghana as an example and presume and assume that some of the beef that we eat in this country, cow meat, come from Niger and come from Burkina Faso, at least Burkina Faso. The onions come from Niger. The tomatoes come from uh, Burkina Faso. After one year, the prices of these commodities will go up, will escalate, because at the point of entry into Ghana, they will attract tariffs. In that sense, it's a Ghanaian citizen who stands to lose because, you know, some of these... Uh, commodities will become more expensive uh, than they are at this moment. After one year, you cannot just take your green passport and then travel to Burkina, Mali, Niger. You need a visa. And if they come in into a coast, they also need a visa. So the free movement of goods, people, and services will also be affected um to 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 different degrees you know so that's the side of the of of the trade the liberalization that ECOWAS has you know pursued then we have a lot of crime beyond security i mean military security or defense security 
We have a lot of other crimes, transnational organized crime, uh, for instance, um, trafficking of narcotics and small arms proliferation within the region. Now, during the period of ECOWAS integration, it was a matter of collaboration that all these 15 member states were collaborating with one another mm -hmm. in order to check, you know, the spate of these, uh, you know, uh, borderless threats, if I should put it that way. And, and Kenna, I wanted and to hold you on that borderless threat that you talk about. So what should be the, what should be the uh, most important consideration right now for ECOWAS? maybe going forward to address these issues that you have just talked about? So now, in light of all of these developments, ECOWAS needs to revisit the reform agenda. Okay. Because there are things that need to change. The notion that when a civilian leader violates ECOWAS <laughs> protocols, indeed national constitutions, rigs elections, as was the case in uh, Sierra Leone, which is the reason why the U.S. administration imposed restrictions on the president and his vice, and the EU has done the same. But ECOWAS and AU, you know, blessed the elections, and then the aftermath are the two uh, attempted coups that we have seen in Sierra Leone, right. which has now gotten the former president to, you know, uh, relocate to Nigeria. We need stability. First of all, political stability. Before we come to the defense military st stability. So ECOWAS needs to reform. And we need to come to the consensus that even if, if, even if you are a civilian and you violate any of the ECOWAS constitution, that amounts to a coup. So it is not only military men removing civilian <clears throat> elected governments who are undertaking coups. It is by anybody who violates the protocols of ECOWAS. If we can come to that understanding, then no head of state can place himself or herself beyond accountability uh, to ECOWAS protocols. Mm. Sadly, that is the situation that we have now. So Blinken comes to West Africa, he goes to Cape Verde, which is a good example of what a democratic state should look like. Then he comes to Cote d'Ivoire and commends Cote d'Ivoire for being a barrier to terrorism. And, but he's not talking about governance deficits in Cote d'Ivoire. Indeed. And that's what? what the issue it is. And uh, Ken Alfesso Sabaji retired and raising those very important issues there. Uh, thank you for joining us here on Ghana Tonight. This is an issue that, as ECOWAS has indicated, they are awaiting official communication. But we'll see how things play out. Uh, here on Ghana tonight, but the a number of things happened at the Public Accounts Committee hearings earlier today, and one of it is the expected appearance of the Controller and Accountant General, um, the specifically in the Western region, um, some issues that needed answers by the uh, Public Accounts Committee. This is what transpired earlier today. So, Controller. Kindly introduce yourselves to the committee. My name is Idwe de Kromwabati, Deputy Controller and Accountant General for Financial Management Services. You, yes, let's have uh, My name is Jacob Yeboa, Deputy Controller for ICT. My name is Kwesi Ejei, Deputy Controller in charge of Treasury. So, why is the controller himself? Yes, uh, Mr. Chairman, respectfully, the controller um, like I informed you earlier, has sought permission due to circumstances beyond his control. He's been represented by three people. Order, order, order. Sought permission from whom? Uh, Honorable Yusuf, yes. So, Chairman, um, I want to find out whether the controller is on leave. Okay? If he's on leave, let's know. Because we were told that he was contesting for an election, and he said that he was still at post and he's capable of handling the two activities. So why is he not here? We need some explanation. And to add to that, you also contested the elections, but you are here. Yes. So he should have been here, regardless of the lost. Honorable, Honorable Abna, answer the question. 
if, if you do not have any answer to the question, then we will not take a controller. He must come and provide the answer. Nobody, Mr. Mr. nobody was holding the dagger. Nobody. I, thought, I thought you have a question. Mr. If you don't have any question. No, I, no, I'm yeah, asking no question. The, it's a prelude. Yeah, got, it's a prelude to the question. It's a prelude to the question. It's a prelude to the question. Well, so that's what happened. As we do know, the Deputy Finance Minister did not give detail, but what we do know as well is that the Controller and Accountant General, Kwesikwene Bosempin, um, who contested in the Tim Swedro primaries of the MPP, uh, lost that closely watched contest, secured 94 votes, while the incumbent MP, Kennedy Osei, emerged victorious with 194 votes. That's a 100 votes difference uh, there. It's not too clear whether that's one of the reasons why he wasn't there at the Public Accounts Committee hearings today. But before we go, uh, the ongoing Africa Cup of Nations, Senegal has been knocked out uh, by host nation Cote d'Ivoire on penalties 5-4 after the game ended in a draw. Well, on behalf of the rest of the team, thank you for joining us here on Ghana tonight. Join us same time tomorrow. My name is Alfred Consit. Do have a good night.